I V M. There is a huge difference in what we you tell your employees to do and what you do yourself. So there should not be any difference. That establishes the credibility of the leader. So leader's credibility is very important when it comes to motivating the people. And it's not that people are not responsive to be responsible or responsive to the organization. So as being was passing through a very difficult period, and in that period. Uh, your uh, uh, reaction would be cut the costs that is what we do but in my view it is very counterproductive it impacts the morale of the people their motivation goes down and self doubt and that's what i uh, said that uh, we will not cut down on any of the staff benefits because uh, my calculation was also that uh, we won't be able to save much only leave people demoralized So, you know, despite the benefit, despite the pay and the problem losses, but uh, whatever incremental benefits which I thought were necessary. Hello and welcome to the Philip Coffee Podcast. The State Bank of India is not just any other bank. I like to think of it as this divine being which manages to straddle multiple universes at the same time in multiple avatars. It is a close confidant of the government of India and a partner in crime and I say this as a figure of speech in decisions like demonetization or saving a dying airline or investing in a long term infrastructure project. It is also a partner to the average Indian daily wage earner in the remotest parts of the country. as sbi is the largest force when it comes to financial inclusion at the same time it is also a competitive brand one that has to fight for attention against the dazzling innovative private banks and has to appeal to the same younger generation like any of the others have to my guest today is mr rajneesh kumar who was chairman of the sbi bank from october 2017 to october 2020 he has served the bank for over 40 years His time at the top was also one of the most tumultuous times to be in a role like that. He has overseen many national crises from demonetization to fall of the jet airways to the crisis at Yes Bank and the issue of non-performing loans or NPLs and of course the rise of fintech itself. His book Custodian of Trust a Banker's Memoir is a riveting read. In it he gives a blow by blow account of the days in which some of these events unfolded especially demonetization. and the crisis at yes bank and jet airways but my favorite part of the book is where he talks about the digital transformation at sbi that he personally oversaw and how he overcame internal challenges and set course to making it a digital first company no mean feat for a company that has close to a quarter million people as employees stay with us we'll be right back on the filter coffee podcast A hundred bucks. That's all it takes to begin your journey with Bitcoin and Ethereum. No, really. With CoinSwitch, you can start investing in over a hundred cryptocurrencies with just hundred rupees. On top of that, there are zero charges for deposits and withdrawals, so you can trade, buy, sell, however and whenever you want. All of this, plus their extremely intuitive interface, makes CoinSwitch the perfect app for beginners in the crypto space. But don't take my word for it. Just download CoinSwitch for free and try it out for yourself. If you'd like more information on cryptocurrencies, tune into a show about crypto with me, Rohan Joshi, my new adventure on IVM Podcasts. Coin switch, kuch to badlega. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, uh, uh, Mr. Rajnish Kumar. How are you doing? Thank you, quite well. Uh, the winter has started, and so is the pollution in Delhi. <laughs> uh, which part of the town do you do you stay in in Delhi? Uh, I stay in Gurgaon. You say in Gurgaon, okay, great. Mr. Rajesh, I I have to tell you that uh, you know when I went through your book, you know I initially was prepared for a book which was going to be a very heavy on banking and terminologies, and I thought you know there's a lot of references I'll have to to do while I was reading the book, um, but uh, I found it to be quite the opposite, right? For someone with a very layman's perspective of the banking world, like me. um i actually found the book to be uh, a sort of a page turner right with, with every incident that you spoke about 
uh, and every phase that you spoke about and uh, i particularly love the the title of the book custodian of uh, of trust uh, which was very poignant and uh, you know really set it up for that sort of a conversation your time you know at sbi is probably also one of the most significant phases um, for india right uh, these three years from october 2017 to 2020 Uh, also witnessed so many unprecedented events uh, which you talk about yourself like the demonetization the merger of six banks uh, within state bank india sbi uh, the whole not npl issue the failure of institutions like ilfs and and dhc uh, the bankruptcy at jet airways and then the, the challenges with yes bank and of course the mother of it all covid right uh, just to put this across you know takes me so much effort how do you look back um, at these three years i thought we can probably start there before i go into individual aspects of the book yeah so uh, i have very clearly mentioned in this book that even the inspiration for writing the book came from this fact that uh, when i took charge as chairman of state bank of india we were in a very tumultuous period at that time uh, two events which were big events when i was not chairman but managing director of the bank they were demonetization and the merger of six banks five were associate banks of the state bank of india and one bharatiya mahila bank so we were in the midst of all this when in october 17 i assumed the charge and then there was a big issue around the non performing loans plaguing the entire banking industry and a huge struggle was going on in managing the balance sheet in managing the profit and loss huge public criticism also every day you could read about like the losses being incurred by the bank so it was a very different kind of an environment and then uh, uh, there were trouble and that is where the first chapter of my book is about trouble in the corridors of money where we had uh, the fourth it was that i would pull off changes full of and and you you detail it them out beautifully while appealing to the people who are very knowledgeable and also people who didn't know about the space right uh, but i wanted to start uh, much much earlier uh, as a boy growing up in in meerut uh, in the 60s if you can just uh, give us a window of uh, you know how how that life was and what some of your early years were like yeah so one is that uh, for all of us i don't know which year you were born but uh, the life before 1991 when the economic reforms were initiated in the country it was very different and the means with most of the families were very limited the kind of growth of middle class which we have seen post 91 it was not there so every household had very limited means very limited belongings and in such an environment making both ends meet was very difficult for most of the people it was an economy of shortages it was a period when india fought couple of wars china then two wars with pakistan so uh, so very different environment in that sense also so in such a backdrop and where my father was working with up government in irrigation department so uh, i had my ups and downs and i mentioned that to initial childhood sickness we were almost i was living by a thread and then overcame that it was god said doctor said family support then primary education of course up to eighth class i studied in there and uh, there are of course it's a good education center good and bad and uh, that was the i can say the foundation of my education was late. i started late but it got straight away into class 2 which normally does not have because i was studying it but that was a very uh, i would say was a blessing for me that my father got to post it to devat it was a lovely city at that time unlike now not crowded right. green you hardly needed fans even in summers so uh, it was a wonderful place to stay and study and devadun uh, we know that it is a one of the best education centers in the country we have very elite schools and not so elite schools but overall the environment is conducive for education and lot of uh, people from service class and like many cities where it will be 
dominated by the business class, but Nehru uh, was different in that sense also. And then back to Meerut, narrow lanes, and uh, Meerut is of course a very historic city. All of us know its contribution in the freedom struggle and a lot of mythological mythology or with they were true, we really don't know. But uh, it has reference to uh, characters in Ramayana. It has, uh, of course, uh, Hastinapur is in, uh, at that time it was in Meera district. So where all the Mahabharat happened. And uh, it's a, that way very, I, we can say that uh, uh, it's, uh, it represents India and the cradle of Indian civilization and history from the very old period. And uh, I would say that despite the fact that uh, the, uh, we had very limited means, but the life was not done and uh, it was full of fun, different kind of fun. And uh, for any small thing you acquire, it was, there was a great excitement around it. Today you don't get that excitement even when you acquire a Mercedes car or a open car. So we had more excitement in acquiring a cycle or a porch or any household item or a refrigerator or a television or a Maruti 800. So uh, Maruti 800, of course, came much later. So uh, uh, as I said, that a uh, lot of friends and, uh, uh, a, and uh, a life full of struggle as far as the financial front is concerned. But at the same time, not lacking in excitement. And then, of course, the big opportunity came and I qualified through and became a professional officer in the bank in 1980. Yeah. Yes. Before you found SBI, or rather SBI found you, you also explored many other career options, isn't it? Um, you wrote the railways exam, applied to the Baba Atomic Research Center, and eventually also became a chartered accountant as well. When you were growing up, what were your career dreams? So basically, I would say that, of course, I was a, like, uh, I did my post-graduation uh, in physics. And uh, probably engineering was a career which would be most appropriate and suitable or becoming a scientist. But the, as I was mentioning that, the family circumstances were such in those days that finding a suitable job for survival was the first priority. And that is where, like me and most of my other friends, we would sit for all type of competitive exam. And then, as you mentioned, that I've written my book. The first was a special class health apprentices, SCRA. Mm-hmm. And uh, very tough, you know, to get into. It was it's supposed to be one of the toughest interest exam, but uh, of course because the advantage is that if you get in, so your study is almost free and then your job is assured in the Indian Railways and uh, SCRAs in Indian Railways, they are on the top of the ladder. That's what I came to know later. Um, so that was the beginning and of course that gave the flavor of all the competitive exams available. So uh, like all of us, we would write an exam for IES, we would write an exam for a bank clerk, bank probationary officer, excise inspector, UB civil services, whichever state was. So in that sense, pursuing a particular career over getting a job for your own survival and family survival. So that became the practice. And of course, uh, luckily, I would say that uh, SBIPO during those times was a very, very coveted job. And many engineers and MBAs, unlike today, when the circumstances have changed, they would uh, join the statement of India as provisionary officers. We had many IITs and MBAs in the rank of provisionary officers in the State Bank of India. Because at that point of time, it was one of the highest paid job in 1980. More than the IES. The salaries were better than the uh, IES. So uh, that is where, like, uh, uh, it was, uh, I would say, amongst the top jobs in the country at that time. We'll talk about SBI in detail later. But to get to the book itself, you, know, you talk about three significant events that have shaped the financial ecosystem of today, especially over the last four or four years. 
In fact, uh, your first three chapters are all about that. The Yes Bank crisis, the fall of Jet Airways and the non-performing loan or the NPL crisis. But the opening chapter titled uh, Trouble in the Corridors of Money likens the Yes Bank crisis to the fall of Lehman Brothers that led to the 2008 crash, isn't it? One that India, of course, successfully avoided thanks to the back-channel diplomacy led by you primarily. Talk to us a bit about how this unraveled and what those days were like. Yeah, so uh, I started my book with the Yes Bank because I think uh, there was a lot of public interest and still there is a lot of public interest about the uh, Yes Bank. Even today people keep on talking about uh, Yes Bank because uh, it was the fourth largest bank. Right. Of course, the, the foundation for the crisis for the financial sector in the country, it was laid by the non performing So there were a lot of problems. And major problems came from the financing of the infrastructure. And uh, any organization and institution which was lending to infrastructure was in trouble. And ILFS was big, not only in financing infrastructure, but constructing it also. And uh, there are very deep related issues when it comes to infrastructure development in the country, and uh, particularly the power sector. And at that time, even for the road sector, there were many issues. Uh, in such a background, because the financial entities are all interconnected, so if one entity has a problem, then it gets spread to others. And it was in this backdrop and with some not so good lending practices probably, Yes, Bank, IFS, the one option, all of them, all of them landed into trouble. Now, for Yes Bank, obviously, because it was the fourth largest bank, its balance sheet size of depositors, money was in excess of one lakh rupees. So it was one of the biggest problems for the country and Reserve Bank of India and the government of for everyone. And if uh, Yes Bank was not rescue in time, then we would have very serious consequences for India. So as a State Bank of India, uh, honestly speaking, we never had interest because we had our own issues. We were grappling with non-performing loans. Merger, of course, by that time, the issues were more or less taken care of. But uh, the problem on the non-performing loan front was uh, quite big for the State Bank of India. And in such a circumstances, where the focus is on strengthening the and taking care of the issues with the State Bank, you would not like one more problem in your head. But circumstances became such that it became inevitable and the State Bank had to step in. Initially, of course, it could be that uh, State Bank alone would come in, but when the assessment of the situation was made, deeper assessment was made, then I thought that it was for great risk as we alone is stepping into it. We had a very large balance sheet, but handling it alone would have been very difficult. And uh, most dreadful thought for me was that if Yes Bank gets merged into State, that would have been a disaster for both. And because uh, there are huge cultural differences in the way State Bank works and the way Yes Bank was functioning or functions and including compensation. So a lot of issues in any merger that it's not about the balance sheet size of Yes Bank, which was from State Bank system that was very really small. But uh, the handling the cultural issues uh, would have taken a lot of management bandwidth and would have been very difficult to resolve issues around it. So in this was in this part of that. Uh, the private sector participation was sought and where Deepak Parik and Uday Kota, because uh, they represented private banking capital in the country. And it was important that it becomes a joint effort. It required a lot of, uh, you know, negotiation, a lot of thinking. But uh, in retrospect, I can say that this was the best uh, which could have happened where a strong bank like the State Bank of India with size at its command and its leadership position in the banking industry in India 
And then we had stall words like people calling and the doctor. They coming up with a helping hand. And it's not only about money. There are many issues on which collective wisdom is required. And uh, once they came on board, then it gave more confidence to me also personally. And we were able to find a solution which was the best suited solution in those circumstances. You know, um, uh, there is a chapter which you have titled as the, the perils of, of networking. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, an amazing insight for me into the world of banking um, was actually the camaraderie and uh, the open uh, communication channels that people like you, Mr. Parekh and Mr. Kotak and many others sort of share. Right? And uh, what I could read between the lines was that there is a collective will in terms of moving the nation forward, right? A larger goal beyond individual organizations, goals, et cetera, right? And and to me, uh, in many of the situations you mentioned, uh, it seems like that has played a very crucial part in in solving a lot of these challenges. Can you spend a little time on that and talk to us about how it is actually? Yeah, so in all these matters, one is what you call the hardcore decisions in the sense which are taken on the basis of uh, your own organization's individual interest. Because we are dealing in money. When we are dealing with money, and that money also belongs not to the institution, but to others, depositors. Money. When you are dealing with that, or shareholders money. So due caution and due diligence has to be exercised. But at the same time, as you mentioned about it, the personal repo, which is between the key players that also helps because if there is a trust at the as you have said the custodian of trust uh, so everything in banking is about trust so trust in the organization like people or depositors have in the banks so banks are really the custodians of trust where people don't hesitate to put their money and uh, their hard earned savings into it. The other is the trust amongst bankers. Say, for example, because uh, Uday, whether it is Uday Kutta, whether it is Deepak Pari, myself, Sandeep Bakshi, or Amitabh Chaudhary, so all these, uh, we, all, all of us, and I came from public sector, they all were from private sector. But the personal rapport and panhami uh, between all of us was such that we trusted each other. And the kind of concerted action which we took, it was because of this trust factor also and appreciating the position of each other. Only then it is possible. Otherwise, normally in marketplace, we are competing. SBI or HDFC Bank or Buddha, ICC, we all are competing. So whereas we are competitors in the market, but at personal level, between the MD, CEO, chairman level. At that time in particular, there was great camaraderie which existed. And in many conversations, myself, Aditya Puri or HDFC Bank, people used to wonder that they are so strong competitors in the market. But at personal level, they enjoy such a good repo, which is not common or unseen. And my view in this matters is that uh, we can compete in the market, we have over strategies, but at the personal level, we all are. I mean, bankers, we have a certain purpose, we all are contributing to the growth of the economy in the country. And uh, there is a question of personal prejudices or egos coming in the way. SBI, it has a little bit of an edge and advantage to be chairman of SBI because of the name of the institution, its importance in the banking industry, and overall the image of the institution, that uh, it's a fair institution, people are people of good integrity are managing this bank. So the if there is a crisis, then the mantle of leadership automatically comes on SBHR. 
So even if, even if you are not willing, but even then she would be forced into that situation. Like yes, it's an interesting situation, right? Like it's almost like uh, you know, if you are the the best student in a class, you know, you're involved in most of the projects or the challenges in the class. You know, just to a small bit about the point you just mentioned, right? I think what I also took away is many of these these big decisions are also sort of made like for example a breakfast or a, or a phone call between you sort of solves probably <coughs> hours and hours of meeting and other things that might have been required right was that a big factor in speed as well the fact that uh, so you could that's also what get I the said, that the credibility of state bank of india as an institution the leadership position which chairman of state bank of india enjoys in the industry in particular and own credibility. That also matters. Right. And it's a combination of these three, where you have the backing of an institution like the State Bank of India. And uh, if your personal image is like, maybe you're considered to be a trustworthy person and uh, who will look through and keep the larger interest in mind and not always be driven by the selfish interest. So that is sometimes a price also you have to pay because we are either as an institution or as this thing to accommodate others. At times you may have to make some sacrifices also. Not in this context of yes bank, but when uh, uh, the when we were trying to resolve NPLs. So many a times other MDs and CEOs will say, sir, you are a state bank. You can take this in. We can't take this in. So those kind of things do help. But uh, ultimately, the trust which others place in you as an individual, uh, that also definitely plays a crucial role in resolving many issues. You know, talking about many issues, just moving on to the other one. Um, I think, uh, you know, the the chapter which was on, on, on Jet Airways, you know, gave readers like me a great insight into, you know, the different layers of complexity you know in that problem and i think two things you had said about the the category sort of stayed with me one is that an airline practically has no asset of value because the, the flights are leased the airport uh, positions are not there uh, and it's a pure service based industry uh, and hence you know the challenges and the 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 risk averseness in in, in financing that category uh, and then you also sp- spoke eloquently about uh, how you know there's no history of uh, a grounded airline coming up you know for 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 these reasons moving on i absolutely love the chapter on jet airways you know, especially your pov on the category itself two things stayed with me one of course where you say that an airline doesn't really have real assets you know its flights are leased its airport spot don't belong to it and for the large part it is a 100% service led revenue which is also why it is difficult, I assume, to find investment in that space. Second, you also talk about later on about how empirically no grounded airline has ever made a comeback. My question to you is, what do you make of civil aviation or the civil aviation business in India? And why is it so difficult to perform here as a company? Particularly, if we're talking about the airlines industrial aviation sector, it is a well-known fact that it's a very difficult sector to be in. But probably the it's a it carries some sort of glamour because I don't know why so many people want to come into airline business when we see that airlines fail regularly world over and India has a history of failed airlines I have lost count so many airlines have failed in India and uh, what makes it difficult one is the competition I think we have overcapacity of seats. So when there is an overcapacity, there is a pressure on the price. Then airlines have no control as far as the pricing of the fuel is concerned. So all your efforts to cut down the cost can become a cropper because uh, the fuel prices you have no control and that cost you almost 45% of the costs when any airline. And as I mentioned, that airlines, they don't have any assets. Mostly their planes are leased and uh, they have all the right to take away the plane if there is a default even of a 
day. So the end slots are also not moved. They are at the discretion of mostly the airport property. There are one or two airports like Heathrow in London where they actually sell the slots and they are transferred. But other than that, that is a big issue. And uh, but still, uh, the sector uh, attracts investment. People do come in. India, of course, there's a huge potential. We are a country of 139 crore people. And we have so many towns which have population of more than 10 to 20 lakh. So regional connectivity is now driving the growth of aviation sector, but uh, uh, but a very difficult sector to be in. Right. You know, you speak about many entrepreneurs in the book, you know, from Avuday Kotak to Avijay Malya to Naresh Kohil to Rana Talwar of Yes Bank and many more. Some of these have been successful over a very, very long period of time and have had their credibility intact. And of course, others have fallen badly. In your opinion, what is the uniqueness of the Indian entrepreneur? No, there is, there is no doubt that uh, uh, the Indians are by nature entrepreneurs. And the circumstances in which you live in India makes you because it is an everyday struggle for most of the people for most of the things in life, uh, which uh, if you compare with an advanced country uh, in uh, like USA or UK or European countries or Japan, I mean, so day to day there is no struggle. But here, because people have to struggle so much, so I think that itself makes them end up into by nature. And that is what we are seeing that even the largest world corporations are now being Manned by Indians because uh, they have that, I think, that uh, entrepreneurship in them, uh, which comes by living in a country like uh, India. And what we are seeing also that uh, that entrepreneurship is now flourishing. So we have so many startups and financial technology companies called fintech. So yeah. every day we have a unicorn in this country. That is all coming up because of the entrepreneurial nature of the people in India. So we don't lack in entrepreneurship. Absolutely no doubt. Indians are born for multitasking. That I have experienced myself having lived abroad for seven years, four years in Canada and three years in UK. Look, uh, the capability of multitasking which Indians possess, I haven't found many many other such examples elsewhere. So they do a particular work well, specializing. But the moment if you ask, suppose a British national, you ask to do something for which is not trained to do, as they say, so they will raise their hands. So this is a very crucial difference. Sometimes jokingly I say that we are over smart people. It would have been all right if we were a little bit less smart. Right. You know, moving on from this, you know, one of the very intense chapters right, is, is on, on demonetization. And um, for me, more than, you know, what happened at the night, I think you were at dinner and uh, Ms. Arundhati Bhattacharya called you and then you, you spoke about, you guys discussed how to prepare for an event like this, which has no precedence. Right? There is no rule book on this. You know, but later on, you know, you, you talk about uh, some of the, the key learnings after you were able to look back at it rationally, uh, some of the key learnings. And, and they all seemed, uh, you know, with the advantage of hindsight, very, very, very tactical in nature. Right? Like, say, for example, you spoke about how we didn't have, we should have created the new nodes in the same size, which would have then negated the need for new trays. And uh, then, of course, the fact that uh, there were more 2,000 nodes printed, which meant that people who wanted lower denomination uh, didn't happen. And then you raised the voice for more 100 notes to be printed um, and, and all of these. You know, if you were to summarize uh, this phase uh, in terms of the, the learnings from this, what would they be? So what was, uh, as I have mentioned in the book, that uh, demonetization exercise, obviously, this type of exercise has to be early, really not more secrecy. Otherwise, it can't. So that is one. Second is, of course, when it has to be in utmost secrecy, obviously, the feedback from the ground and the detailed planning is not possible. And that is where all the problems are. So, and that was my purpose of, you know, putting this chapter in 
books that at least for future there would be a primer that to what can go wrong and so it is all about managing the logistics and to, when we are dealing with a currency in the range of 14 to 15 lakh crore notes to be returned and replenished obviously it is a logistics like you know for the banks and the people who were part of it and not every situation could be envisaged so rules had to be frequently amended by reserve bank because when you realize there is a family in the marriage that could be. then there was a rule that yes you show the invitation card you can take more cash out of the bank otherwise there was a ceiling of 50000 so these type of situations unless you plan for at least a year or so and even if after that planning you will not get it right so that's why like uh, for an exercise of this magnitude it was obvious that to uh, logis- putting logistics in place uh, from day one it would be extremely difficult and it was extremely difficult i mentioned also in the statement we can handle crowds we can handle high volume of transactions but even for a bank like the state bank of india it proved to be very difficult but uh, definitely as we managed it better than other banks because of all the experience which we had come on but uh, many things like size of the notes uh, because changing the cassettes in the atms itself to and uh, more than two lakh atms was a big issue and uh, unless atms functioned then you could not reduce the queues and crowds at the branch and this was obviously a big gap 100 rupee notes and 2000 and in a country where uh, the average income level of maybe 100 crore people is not more than 80 rupees a day or 100 rupees a day so what will they do with the 2000 rupees so these are the things but as i said that is all when it happens and in i said then capability of rbi to take back the old notes so what you will have you will have the new notes and you will have the old notes in your currency chest or this thing so no storage place at the banks and rbi also did not have the storage they did not have the machines to shed those notes which were being returned counting of those notes. so all these were a, like a big logistic challenge but eventually i think an exercise of this magnitude we were able to complete uh, which itself is a i would say a record and uh, not in everybody's capability to do it you can choose to answer my next question or not but um, from your vantage point what is the economic impact short medium and long term of demonetization in this country so when the a decision or an action of this magnitude happens it may take a little bit more time to evaluate its consequences and in fact it is a subject matter of economic research in my because whatever people say a lot of people have said that formalization of the economy has gathered peace and this is corroborated by the fact by the number of tax payers which have increased higher gst collection but for a country like india on the other hand the people argument is that it has impacted it firstly the informal sector of the economy so on balance if you look at it whether formalized economy with better tax compliance more taxes being gathered more audit trails available of the transactions so logically you would say it is a better then we have to formalize it but for a country of uh, 139 people their unemployment is high so there would definitely be the other side of the argument that the informal sector of economy in india needs to do well to absorb all these unemployed people so i am not the right person in fact to take a call on this chair because as i said that you need empirical evidence you need research to arrive at a conclusion and there would always be a debate around it it would be very difficult to uh, prove conclusively that whether it benefited or did not benefit 
fair enough another question again uh, feel free to answer is uh, you know at, at this point right, i think the the, the five six months probably after the announcement there was a huge human cost to it of course and there were a lot of things were riding very high emotionally right are there incidents days which were you know particularly more uh, intense and, and difficult for you not just as as a chairman of the largest bank in india but as a person and, and is there anything you would like to recount on those lines demonetization i think initial uh, two three months when when all the notes were exchanged i think there was a 45 days period or 60 days period and people had to uh, be in the queue in front of the banks and uh, those kind of logistics issues but they started falling in place as soon as the banks were able to reconfigure the atms the supply of 500 rupees notes got improved so gradually uh, and uh, there was less panic in the market the rules were amended to take care that people are not inconvenienced that this comes to their health care or you know high requirement of cash for body functions and those type of things so other than that i would say and i have mentioned the book that in bombay like i visited a couple of branches so people who were in the queue they seem to be like contrary to what we would be but they said no no a acha decision so like they were looking it as a fight against corruption against rich people so that was the situation at that time and uh, there was difficulty but i think uh, what i was said was the event is here over so we will tend to forget that and then it becomes a matter of past now like it is uh, almost 5 years now it is a matter of past as i said that this is no immediate consequence but only the impact on the in economy and uh, this thing that is uh, where uh, like some economists they need to find out and tell I think we'll leave it at that, uh, that. That someone needs to find out and and, and tell. Uh, you know, moving on to the part where I've been really wanting to get your point of view on is on the topic on you know uh, NPLs, non-performing loans. You you speak about how people don't remember or realize what State Bank of India means to the country, right? And you talk about how some of the biggest airports, some of the biggest infrastructure projects, and all of those. are made possible because you know there is an sbu that you created almost 25 30 years back which is investing in in projects like that right um you know for the layman uh, how would you describe what state bank of india means um not just as a bank but 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 as an institution for this country state bank of india is an institution which i believe everybody should be proud of in this country and why is it so Uh, not because I am, I have served it or I have been its chair. Not that is not the reason. The reason is that the lives it touches. So State Bank has forty six crore, out of which about eighteen crore accounts are of what you call financially included, financial inclusion initiatives or PM Janda. So thirty two percent. Of general accounts have been opened by state. Its reach, if you travel across the country, if uh, one thing which you will find is the state bank of India. Whether even if you track to Himalayan glaciers, you will find us. So the reach, the number of accounts, the number of people it serves, and the way it has, you know, the way it has changed itself in terms of technology and parts. its performance now uh, which is coming out after we had a back period of 3 4 years so in every aspect where it is government owned it has proved that even if you are government owned that does not mean bad governance that does not mean that you can perform so in a sense uh, whatever is the state of the society someone who is amongst the poorest and someone who is amongst the richest serving is such a wide spectrum of people it's not a mean achievement in life and uh, that's why its role is very critical as far as indian banking financial system or the economics 
And whatever the government also does, whether it is social banking or even it is demonetization or anything else, whether it is its infrastructure development, without uh, SPI being there, it seems to be not possible. Yeah, this is actually a great segue for me to talk about um, brand SBI and SBI as the employer. The moment you say state bank, the picture in everyone's mind is that of an old fashioned office, you know, with a lot of files on tables and a teller who's behind a cage. Overall, not something that you associate with cutting edge technology. But in the last four or five years, one can see a transformation. It is evident, you know, when you visit the branches, it is also evident on your digital assets, especially with the launch of Yono, your uh, D2C app. How did this journey pan out for you? Yeah, so whenever a new thing is done, obviously there would be naysayers also at all levels. That is true. And, uh, but at the same time, and as I said, that this decision about uh, digital transformation where all the customer journeys to be visited. It was decided at this part of the moment when the presentations were being made and I could clearly see that only developing a marketplace uh, and bringing it to the customers of the State Bank of India would not be very helpful from the customer's point of view. Aspect. Maybe you will have greater attraction amongst the youth. But what was the need of the hour? Was, and that is the question I asked at the time is, then what about our existing 40 crore customers? What value does it bring when we're doing it? Second is that most of the time you end up doing things which are incremental. But this was first time when we were begging from the past and said we will do it in a very holistic manner, not incremental. Bank had all sorts of mobile applications. And uh, we were adding more and more features or bringing out a new mobile app. But this was when we broke from the past and we said altogether a new digital platform will be built. And anything or everything, whatever bank does, we have to find a reason to say that we it cannot be done on mobile. And then we found that everything can be done on mobile. And that is all this whole concept which started by bringing a marketplace on a bank's mobile banking platform to do everything on mobile banking, it is started. It requires definitely commitment at the top level, unless chairman or managing director, they push things on. Then, of course, for any project to succeed of this magnitude, top management buying and the employees buying and the customer buying. These are essentially the three stakeholders. So management, first it has to be buy-in at the management level, then it has to be for employees and customers. Employees, when they see the convenience, then that buy-in starts. Initially, there would be always a skepticism around anything new you do. And customers, again, once they see the benefits, it happens. So once the initial momentum builds up, and then the demand also keeps on coming from employees and customers. Why can't we do this on mobile banking? Why can't we do this? The advantages are huge. I will just, one small example is that uh, for opening a savings bank account in the bank, if you, before you came in and we started opening accounts on mobile, it used to take typically 45 minutes to open an account. But when you can set up the same account in 8 to 10 minutes, obviously employees will clever for more and more. And that builds the sustain, uh, sustainable momentum. The other thing about the banding is because SBI itself is a big bank and uh, has the benefit of more than 100,000 touch points. So you don't need to hire any new space, in fact. Because all your branches, all your APMs, all your business correspondents, so you touch so many missing and employees, they become your brand investor. So uh, making them your brand investor, uh, using the network, and as I said, the product itself, you're a branding person, so I don't have to tell you that. You can't sell a bad product for long. But initially, you need people who will tell or word of mouth that, Yes, this is a 
good product. And currently, I think the latest number is about that, about 4.3 crore people are using. The senior it is adjusted to be one of the best mobile banking applications in the country. And globally also, nobody has achieved the kind of things which uh, SBI has achieved through you. So it is uh, also a subject matter of discussion at global banks. And uh, this question that despite government ownership, you are in public sector, you can't do things, that is a fallacy. You can do things even if there is a government. You know, digital transformation challenges are always internal, isn't it? From personal experience, I can tell you, in 2019, we tried to move a lot of internal communication between teams in our agency to to platforms like Microsoft Teams and Yammer. And there was a huge resistance, you know, from everyone. Even though we're talking about an industry like advertising, which is usually very used to constant change. How did you handle these internal challenges to digital transformation? Especially for an organization with over 200,000 employees, it must have been an uphill challenge, isn't it? Technology, yes. Uh, right. Bank, uh, we were 250,000 people when I joined the bank. And even today, we are 250,000 people. But look at it. That the kind of growth banking is seen manually. And if you have not adopted technology, can a state bank and be 46 crore customers? So, uh, and uh, in 1980, there was no Infosys, no TCS, or it may, they may be, uh, Infosys was not technically there. TCS, I'm not sure whether it was there or not at that time. So, technology companies did not take this. So, this logic doesn't work. If certain things have to happen, they will happen. Corporates, they would need efficiency. Technology helps in improving the productivity, efficiency, and doing better. Like you, and it applies to everything else. So if we did not have IRCTC uh, and uh, online booking system of railways, we would still be standing in the queues at a railway station and booking our tickets and wasting time. So the productivity gain for the economy it is there because of the technology, and the business expands, and the costs are costs are. Good. So you reap the benefit of improvement in productivity to say that if banking system, number of people say the state bank has gone now, but the number of people in the technology companies or the connected logistics, we we'll just see the growth and the same. So this argument would not work. And say, for example, the mobile banking, or it is not substituting your branch network. But it is helping the bank in bringing more customers, more business. Your marginal costs are almost then become very low. And that is the benefit which the organization would get. So now if you have a bank which has adopted technology, so they will grow. They will grow profit compared to any other bank which has not adopted technology. So how will they compete? And you have... On the other private sector banks, your financial technology companies. So when you're competing in a market, then you have to compete on the basis of efficiency. You can't compete on the basis of inefficiency. There is a like, principle of the market. And uh, you nobody has the power to defy the power of the market. So for any organization to survive, there's no choice but to uh, adopt technology and be in the required efficiency. But uh, that brings us definitely more. Uh, you know, there's also a chapter on the way you have dealt with the with the workforce. I'm asking since we're talking about the workforce. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, heads of businesses listening to this episode, right, uh, would love to know, you know, how you're able to create a certain um, an employee culture, uh, bringing them together towards a common goal, right, um, which is of a size that is unimaginable, you know, to, to, to most leaders. In this, in this country, right? I'm sure they'll, they'll look for some, some lessons to learn from you. And, you know, I also wanted to put this in perspective of a particular initiative that you did, which you talk about in the book, which is, I think it's called Abhivyakti, uh, mm. which is a, a large scale survey uh, you did to understand how people feel about the workplace at SBI, right? Talk to us a little bit about Abhivyakti and also building that culture. Yeah. So uh, one is... Uh... That uh, if that particular chapter in the book about the HR, there are a couple of things which I do. One is 
a public sector organization like a state bank it has its own limitations when it comes to the rigidity around the compensation so it people get paid according to a very set rules there is no discretion for any to do anything even if you want to give a variable component that you counsel to according to a very set rules it would not be that this person has performed exceedingly well so he should be paid you will say it's not such a good thing but to me it is also not such a bad thing and why i say so that it does not create jealousy so it's good for more team work when you are rewarding individuals for their excellent performance disproportionate it does also give rise somewhere to some conflicts and jets which is not a good thing for the second thing is diminishing value of the money so the holistic approach uh, which i was there we should focus on the overall mental health welfare of the people and small gestures so in the chapter there are many things which are about bereavement leave or like uh, if there is a death on account of covid or otherwise also improvement in the compensation structure in that sense that uh, we allow people to feel that uh, even if there is a death in the family if the um, uh, employee then his family should not immediately feel left out at least bank should do a good deal for and holding for 6 to 2 months to 1 year that change in approach work life balance is very important because in a state bank we have the culture of a culture that developed where people were being called on saturday sundays and late sitting has always been the, like a, a problem with the state bank i have experienced it myself in early days and uh, so all those things so these were the gestures which were all oriented towards the welfare of the family rather than just putting in more money in the hands of the people on which in any case i had no control because that will be determined by the next association so the point which i try to make in the chapter is that again within the limitations there are certain things which don't cost you too much but the very approach and attitude of the management that you are trying to understand their problem and trying to show empathy and compassion that does create a positive positive attitude and motivation is difficult when it took 2000 people there would still be people who would be discontent you do anything they would not feel happy but a large chunk if they feel happy then it is all right so rather than focusing on negative energy and out tackle it focus on the positive energy. another element which is important is that how do you conduct yourself and your management team so most of the time there is a huge difference in what we you tell your employees to do and what you do yourself so there should not be any difference that establishes the credibility of the leader so leader's credibility is very important when it comes to motivating the people and it's not that people are not responsible to be responsible or responsible to the organization so as we was passing through a very difficult period and in that period Uh, your uh, uh, reaction would be cut the costs that is what we do but in my view it is very counterproductive it impacts the morale of the people their motivation goes down and self doubt and that's what i uh, said that uh, we will not cut down on any of the staff benefits because uh, my calculation was also that uh, we won't be able to save much only leave people demoralized so you know despite the benefit despite the pay and the problem losses but uh, whatever incremental benefits which i thought were necessary like uh, say expenditure on their health so we improve the health expenses part there it became very limited so here for example this is a very small example said we will may say that these are very small things but in terms of impact they are not so small So in SBI we had a rule that if the the employee himself he becomes ill, hundred percent expenditure was reimbursable. But for family it was seventy five percent. I said make it hundred percent for family. Costing wise not a huge cost for the bank of state bank side. Impact wise uh, you won't believe it what kind of impact it 
created and lead to employee motivation. So sometimes uh, by small gestures, without impacting your PNL by a huge amount, you can achieve the desired results because uh, then it establishes a connect between the ground level employees and the top. And another thing is, as we move up the ladder, we start losing connect with the ground. So that is when all these uh, farmans come off, like uh, expecting people to do things which are otherwise not possible. So I was always very careful that we don't ask people to do things which are very difficult for them to achieve. So essentially, I would, if I were to summarize this, is small gestures oriented towards family life. Second, own credibility and conduct. Third is connect. We talk a lot of connect, but most of the time a CEO or a chairman or MD, they live in their egos. They don't talk to the people down the line. Their doors would be closed. Uh, a, uh, an officer below a certain bank cannot enter their room. In my room as a chairman, you get a messenger from home. So open door policy. You get so much feedback from the ground. So these are some of the things which worked. And uh, Abhivyakti is that, yes, you are doing so much thing, but periodically you need to check that what the majority feels. As I said, that it is impossible to satisfy all 250,000 people despite best effort. There would somewhere would be a, an aggrieved employee or feels disillusioned with the organization, with the way management works or HR works. You can tell within the family also, it is impossible to keep all the members in a small family. We are talking about 150,000 people. But it's still overall direction and focusing on creation of the positive energy. Many times I have seen in my organization, people waste time on correcting those who are in college. And uh, my philosophy was clear that if there are such people, if they can improve, fine. But our entire energy should not be focused on them. If there are 80, 85%, 90% people who have a positive attitude and they are willing to work and to respond to you, then your energy should not be wasted on those type of person. On the survey itself, um, was there any learnings that uh, surprised you in a, in a good or a, or a bad way that you did not think of earlier? No, like uh, I think uh, the, in the survey when we benchmarked it with the peers, so uh, as we turned out to be doing fairly all right on all the parameters. Right. You know, um, moving on to one, one rather personal question, which is, um, you know, as you look back, uh, if you were to, I think it's the November 1980s when you joined State Bank as a probationary officer, and uh, I'm sure your family, yourself, and the branch you joined might not have thought that a future chairman is, is, is walking through our doors. But if you were to meet that young man and, uh, you know, tell him a few things about uh, what the next 30, 35 years ahead are, 40 years rather, what would you tell that young man? I have placed a lot of premium, if I can speak, on the positive attitude towards life and work. In any organization, or any individual, I have seen people who are very intelligent. And I have no hesitation in that being more intelligent than what I can claim to. Hardworking, more hardworking. I cannot say that only I was who worked very hard. So they were equally or more hardworking people. But what helps, or what helped me at least, was having a positive attitude towards life and work even in most adverse circumstances. And uh, that can be a differentiating factor. And uh, rest is all like in banking. If you're putting it anywhere, for that matter, in the personal integrity and honesty, that matters a lot. Whereas some nature, if you have, you can have problems. And with a positive attitude, you're, you will be less worried. Because when you have a positive attitude towards yourself and others, then the points of friction would also be fewer. That is what I have felt. Many people uh, who are intelligent, hardworking, but sometimes they feel that uh, they, feel, they, they feel very highly about themselves. So at times that is also a problem. 
then you most of the time you are uh, confronting with others and having friction with others point of view but when you are resolving a complex problem unless you have the capability to give leeway to others opinion with others point of view then uh, you are always in friction and confrontation so that also is not very helpful so on the balance i would say your own intelligence on which i don't think that you can develop it but not much can do you are what you have capability to work hard again it is an attribute some people are capable of working day and night some are not at least i am not who can work day and night for 24 hours so i work but i work uh, after 8 hours i am exhausted so i can't work more than it and that's what i felt about my people also that they should not work more than what is required of them and but i've never said it like earlier to anything any work no because most of the time people say this is not my work but i will always say that if you do it you will learn something new so that was a positive attitude and the problems analysis where you feel that they are out of your control or you can't do it then i don't waste time in attempting to do something which is not possible so that is a practical way of i would say doing things assessing things so you should attempt only those things where you believe that they can be done and are humanly possible sometimes we put targets on people say for example setting a target so we want that yes there has to be a stretch but you will put impossible targets and the demotivation or demoralization will start from that building itself so a practical approach to life also helps in shape but i put as i said that apart from all these personal honesty integrity hard work uh, all this is but uh, to me positive attitude uh, is one of the most important traits that helps and there should not be any difference between what you say and what you do so as a leader of course that attitude of like establishing your credibility as a leader that becomes very really important and uh, nobody likes to be you know cheated or deceived that can happen only when there is only no your actions and what you preach beautifully put um sir we usually end the episode by asking our guests on a very lighter vein hmm. uh, what uh, he or she is watching reading or or listening to um what are some of the things you're you're watching these days i'm assuming you have some free time now or more than uh, earlier uh, and what are your what are the things you are you're reading which you love to recommend so the reading i uh, i keep on doing and uh, from the childhood that has been some sort of a passion that i read books and of all gen the sort is specific but mythology interests me more and of course recently uh, i've been reading on the tao gosh this trilogy so uh, there are all this uh, historical or something so anything which is historical it interests me a lot then uh, movies i am big fan uh, the recently of course that has been impacted but we have no netflix and prime and, uh, everything as well but uh, i enjoy more doing movie theaters and watching uh, movies and uh, but uh, uh, sports also i am quite passionate so Uh, I'm uh, playing badminton, I play table tennis, indoor games, chess, this kind of. So there are a lot of things to do. And uh, as I said, that uh, I have worked in an, I have a couple of assignments and engagements. So it's a very good balance between uh, all these four things. Uh, four things means you do work, not as much as you were doing as a chairman or managing director, and uh, play sports. both outdoor indoor whenever time late something when uh, nowadays like internet is a great thing to surf and keep yourself up to date and right. spend quality time with the family so i am uh, fond of traveling also luckily last couple of months uh, i've been able to travel so uh, there are there's so many things uh, what are some of the favorites in in cinema uh, always hindi masala movies i like I don't like serious type of movies. <laughs> anything you you've uh, you have an all time favorite? Anything you've seen recently that you've loved? No, but uh, all time favorites have been all those uh, mid seventies, Shole, Diva, Zinjir, those kind of movies. 
अमिताभ बच्चन मूवीज आई बोल रहा हूँ ऑफ कोर्स अक्षय कुमार करीब की आई थिंक आई लाइक मूवीज और ए वेरी लाइट मूवी लाइक बधाई हो सो दिस टाइप ऑफ लाइक लाइट मूवीज नॉट वेरी नॉट हैवी स्टफ और सीरियस मूवीज वॉन्डरफुल Sir, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. A great honor as well for you to have been in the show. And oh, uh, thank you, Karthik. And I'm really impressed with your uh, range of questions as well as your voice. Thank you so much. I wish you a very happy rest of the career and the book, all the all the success. I can't wait to recommend this to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM Network. You can listen to us on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter and Filter underscore Coffee. That's Coffee with a K on Instagram. It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. From Jeff Bezos to Amitabh Bachchan, everyone has tasted failure, but they don't give up. On Probation and Promotion, the Kabina talks about failure and how to use it as a stepping stone towards your goals. On a show about crypto, Rohan and Jasbir Bindra, founder of the Tech Whisperer, debate whether blockchain could be considered socialist in nature. On the longest constitution, Priyam Mehta sheds light on untouchability in the workplace with the help of Article 17. Witness the liberation of Bangladesh in the season finale of War and Warriors as narrated by Air Vice Marshal Arjun Subramaniam and on Audio Gaan Kedar is joined by writer Himali Kothari they talk about project 87 this project focuses on english language plays from india do follow us on social media we're ivm podcast on twitter facebook instagram and linkedin and remember if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter please do tell a friend go check out our youtube channels we go live on a whole bunch of different things we have a number of different channels you can find them on ivmpodcast.com/youtube and finally we'd like to thank our sponsors this week Cred, Bank of Baroda, Coinswitch Cooper, Intel and Oxfam India. Thank you for making this possible. What if you could relive some of the biggest and most public feuds in Indian corporate history? We are back through the window of time to see who among HUL or Nirma stood on top or who was more dominant between Tata Motors and Maruti Suzuki. Tune in with me Ambi Parmeshwaran and me Anupam Gupta on Bank of Baroda presents The Last Brand Standing. where we talk about two brands vying for the top position and what their journeys were every tuesday on the ibm podcast app or website or wherever you get your podcast from